Why did A.J. Brown get traded? Because the Titans would not give him a contract that he would sign. You know, I think what their contract offer to him was, it was up to twenty million a year. I remember the Eagles gave him twenty five a year, but it was up to twenty million a year. But it was backloaded, so I think the first couple of years were like fifteen million or sixteen million, something like that. So they wouldn't go up, and the Eagles had actually like under the radar made a pursuit of him, and the Titans wouldn't engage, wouldn't engage. Once talks broke down, it was like, all right, we're either. And I think things really kicked into gear. Ironically, kind of when I found out about it, not that I had any, I'm just saying when I found out about it, like 1 or 2 p.m., this was a really fast deal to get done. But it had to because if you're going to trade for a 1, you've got to do it in time to make the pick. And the Titans needed to be able to replace him. So once it was like, all right, talks are breaking down. We're not going to do this deal. Now we have to trade him because we got to get the pick back. So then it was like really just a mad dash. And they got it done, and he got a really nice deal. He did, and then the Titans were able to draft his exact comp, according to Daniel Jeremiah. So where does you know, this... I thought, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. I thought that was such a cool part of our show. It was like, as soon as it happened, I could hear Daniel Jeremiah laughing because he goes, this is my exact comp. And I thought it was so a perfect explanation for why it happened, how a team moves on. It was whole thing was very cool. Yeah, I mean, and he did it. Another one happened when Desmond Ritter gets drafted by Atlanta. His comp for Desmond Ritter is Marcus Mariota. You know, <laughs> and so, I mean, he, he that, that happened multiple times during our three days, just a testament to how terrific Daniel is at, at, uh, at evaluating and, and uh, executing his, his vision for, for us as, as a broadcaster. But, um, you know, to see to see this happen, though, where one team's like, yeah, I'll pay a, a, a guy going to his fourth year $25 million bucks, nope, a year. And the other team's like, we're, yeah, we're not doing it. As a matter of fact, we're going to draft his exact comp replacement here and have more contractual control at, at the amount of money that he might earn over the first four years of the deal is exactly the, the annual salary we were unwilling to pay somebody. You know, I, I just find that fascinating to me, that th- this receiver position in the NFL and where it's going. Fascinating to me. I, you know. I am so with you. It's, we've never really seen anything like this where you have one side firmly convinced that, all right, there is a number at this position I will just not go higher than, even if it's my own guy, who I love, who I drafted, who I could show everyone how right I was for drafting this guy and pay him a bunch of money, and I just believe the value is too high, I'm not going to do it. And then you have another side who goes, I must have this guy. I don't care what I'll pay him. I'll make him the highest paid receiver and trade draft picks for him because that's how valuable he will be to us. And we're talking about the same player. And, like, there's not a lot of precedent for this where you have homegrown players, homegrown players who their team won't pay but have so much value to the outside world that they can get a first-round pick and more and a huge contract to get these guys. Like, it is as like diametrically opposed as anything we've seen in the NFL. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.